got to say it, y'all. I got to say this. I think it's fair to say that uh, the group Gangsta, one of the greatest hip hop groups of all time. DJ Premier is one of the greatest producers of all time. And Guru is one of the greatest lyrical MCs of all time. One of the greatest lyrical rappers to ever touch the mic. He is definitely in the greatest 50 rappers list. He's on that list. And, you know, Guru really didn't curse that much in his music either. He's kind of conscious. He's a conscious rapper too. Even though, you know, they're not from New York, but they created the New York sound in the 90s. I I thought they was from Brooklyn, to be honest, but Gangstar international stars overseas too when Guru put that Jazzmatazz album out I remember getting that Jazzmatazz album out of that magazine for like one cent remember that magazine when you could order a bunch of CDs and tapes I had that Jazzmatazz uh, tape he mixed jazz and hip hop together he was educated with a college degree but the way he just died though man it was just so crazy just and it's sad too it was a bunch of controversy about how his business partner treated him during his final days it was crazy man so let's get into guru's story right now guru's birth name is keith edwards elam and he was born on july 17th 1961 in boston massachusetts he actually grew up in Roxbury, um, a few blocks from where the group, the kids, uh, the new kids on the block used to be at, used to practice and stuff. Now, he was one of four kids born to his parents. His father, Harry Elam, was a judge and his mother was a librarian for the Boston public school system. Now, as a kid, he was asthmatic. He had asthma real bad, but... You know, love music. Growing up, he was influenced by a lot of jazz musicians like Roy Ayers and Donald Byrd and them. But as far as his upbringing as a kid, he had a pretty good life. Like I said, his father was one of the first black judges in Massachusetts. So everybody knew him and his whole family. They were educators. Now, by the time he got in his teens, now according to his older brother, he said Guru was also a speed skater. But also around that time, he ended up meeting one of his best friends, which was rapper Big Suge, who back then went by the name Sugar Bear. They were about 16 years old when they first met. And, you know, from always seeing each other at parties and stuff like that, you know, Suge was from the hood and in the streets, but they became real cool. Big Suge said uh, when they first, when he first went to um, Guru's house, Security guards had stopped him and pulled out guns and everything until huh, Guru's dad told him, no, nah, that's Guru's friend right there. Wow. You know, his dad was the black judge. He had security and everything over there. You know, his family, Guru's family was living better than a lot of people in that neighborhood. But Guru, he wanted to be like the cool kids, which were the thugs in the streets from the projects and the ones that didn't have a two parent household. He wanted that street credit like Big Suge had. And, you know, he started acting out and getting into a lot of trouble, trying to be like them. And he even asked his father, why did he become a judge? Because all of his friends hated judges. <laughs> That's crazy. But, you know, his family ended up getting him back on the right path and focus after that, that little street phase he went through. And after graduating high school, he went to Morehouse College in Atlanta. And Big Suge ended up moving down there, too, with his mom. He wanted to play football, but he ended up moving down there with his mom. So when they bumped into each other again, him and Guru hooked up and they formed a singing group. Wow. Believe it or not, y'all, Guru wasn't even rapping yet. He didn't start rapping until his senior year in college. Him and Suge was singing at first. I mean, you know, he was a, still a fan of hip-hop growing up, Run DMC, Busy B, and all of them, but Suge started writing his rhymes for him and showed him how to rap. Big Suge was a poet, and 
was the one who taught him how to rap and helped develop his style and flow. And once he learned how to rap, he just fell in love with hip-hop and wanted to make it a career. He wanted to make a career out of it. He started calling himself Keithy E. Now, after that, and graduating with a degree in business and administration from Morehouse College, plus taking graduate classes at the Fashion Institute of Technology in Manhattan, Guru, he had a bunch of good jobs lined up, but he, he was focused on rap. He wanted to be a rapper now. So when he got back to Boston, and then Big Suge ended up coming back to Boston too, they hooked back up. And hip-hop at that time was getting big. Break dancing, DJing and beatboxing on every corner. Him and Big Shug continued to focus on being hip-hop artists and continued to perform at clubs, schools, parties, or whatever. And they started calling themselves Gangstar because originally they were going to call themselves the Gangsters, but then they switched it up. The way they came up with the name Gangstar was like Big Shug said, you know, he was in a gang and in the streets for real. And then they added the star to it because Guru was educated, came from a good family. He was like a star. That's how they came up with the name Gangstar, according to Big Shug. So once they became a group, Guru, Big Shug, and now they added a DJ to the group, they had, they had put a single out and started to generate a little buzz with their music. And Guru was taking it serious. He really started to take it real serious because he had to prove to his family that being a rapper, you can make money, you can make a career out of it. You know, his family was, they just couldn't understand why he wanted to be a rapper. They wanted him to be a teacher. And they was kind of disappointed in him, but Guru had his mind made up. He wanted to prove to him that he can make it. But see, Big Suge was too deep in the streets. And Guru didn't want to be around that stuff. So Guru left Boston, went to New York and tried to get a record deal. And you know, Big Suge stayed in Boston. And he ended up going to prison for about three years. So when Guru got to New York, he changed his name from Keithy E to Key T. And he got himself a job. He got an apartment and started working on his demo and would rap at open mics and talent shows and stuff. You know, he started going around to all the record labels hoping to get a deal, but everybody just turned him down except one independent record label and that was Wild Pitch Records. You know, Wild Pitch was just a, a husband and wife company, but the husband, Stu Fine, he ran the label. He ran the label, and once he got at Wild Pitch Records, you know, he started to build a good relationship with the staff members. And, you know, Guru had a group with him from Boston that was there with him, but they just couldn't get along. They was always fighting and stuff, so Guru cut them off, and he started looking for some other members to put in the Gangstar group. And, you know, he would actually, when he was at Wild Pitch, Guru would actually be like the A&R, you know, at Wild Pitch Records, listening to other rappers and producers' demos who was trying to get a deal at Wild Pitch at the time. He said uh, he even heard rapper Lord Finesse demo when, it was, when he sent it there. But another one of those demos that he came across was a group called MC Top Ski and Wax Master C. You know, Wax Master C, which later became DJ Premier, you know, he was from Houston, Texas. And at the time, he was a college DJ at Prairie View A&M University. But, you know, he was familiar with New York because he had family there. Premier used to be in New York a lot growing up. But anyway, so Guru heard their demo and he loved the beats, though. He loved the beats because of the you know, he had a lot of jazz samples. DJ Premier had a lot of jazz samples. He had real DJ scratching in the beats. And Guru just loved that. <laughs> he took the he took their demo home and started freestyling over the beats. He didn't really like the rapper Top Ski that was in the group with uh, DJ Premier. He just liked Primo Beats. And once they linked up, got together, the rest is history. They just hit it off because of their love for jazz music. And plus, both of their parents were educators. Guru family 
you know, there was educators and, and uh, DJ Premier's family was educators. And that's when they changed their name. You know, Kiti started going by Guru, which stood for Gifted Unlimited Rhymes Universal. And Wax Master C changed his name to DJ Premier. And they did that whole album in two weeks. On April 22nd, 1989, they released the album titled No More Mr. Nice Guy, which hit number 83 on the Billboard R&B chart. And the single called Positivity hit number 19 on the Billboard rap chart. But look, my song, <laughs> The Words That I Manifest, that was my junk right there. When Marley Ma and DJ Red Alert played it as the opening song on the radio in New York on their station, it was on and popping from there. Another song I liked was the song uh, No More Mr. Nice Guy. I know Little Kim used that same sample for her song called No Time on her album. But they had some competition that year, man. 89, Special Ed had just dropped. Kwame. Uh, De La Soul. EPMD came back out. The DOC. There's a lot of dope albums that came out that year in 89. But after that album dropped, though, Gangstar started to get frustrated with Wild Pitch Records over the creativity and over the money. They were still working the job when they had that album out. Guru was working with Foster Kids and DJ Premier was like working as a counselor or something. But the good news was they also got a call from movie director Spike Lee because he saw the manifest video and he brought the album. And he loved the song jazz music. And he wanted them to do a song for his movie, Mo Better Blues, with Branford Marcellus, the jazz artist. And they recorded the song called Jazz Thing, which helped push that Mo Better Blues soundtrack to number one on the U.S. traditional jazz albums charts. Now, after that, they ended up leaving Wild Pitch Records and signed with the major label Chrysalis Records because of the song jazz music on the Mo Better Blues soundtrack. The label actually thought they were a hip hop jazz group. Now on a major label, Chrysalis Records, you know, they went straight to work and on January 15th, 1991, they released their second album titled Step in the Arena, which hit number 19 on the US top R&B hip hop albums billboard charts. The song, Just to Get a Rep, Hit number five on the Hot Rap Singles charts. That video, man, I had that. I had recorded that video too back in the day. That video had real stick up kids and drug dealers in it too. RZA said that in an interview one time. He knew all the cats that was in that video. There were some serious dudes. I used to like the song called Love Sick though. And that hit number 11 on the charts. And the song Who's Gonna Take the Weight was my junk too. Now, the following year, in 1992, they released their third album titled Daily Operation with the songs like Ex-Girl to Next Girl, Take It Personal, and a song called I'm the Man had a little dap from Group Home on there, and J. Rue the Damager was featured on it. They were, see, they was all, J. Rue and all of them, that's all Guru friends from the hood in Brooklyn. And he also said, uh, Guru also said, him, Biggie, and Little C's used to chill all the time, smoking blunts and drinking 40s. He knew all them cats from Brooklyn. And that's when they created the Gangstar Foundation around that time, too. And they went on tour with EPMD. After that album, right, Guru released the album titled Jazzmatazz, Volume 1, an experimental fusion of hip-hop and jazz. You know, I used to love the song he had out called uh, Trust Me, featuring India Davenport from the group called the Brand New Heavies. Y'all remember the Brand New Heavies? But that was my junk, but you know, that song hit number 34 on a UK singles chart and number 105 on the US Billboard Hot 100. Now, in an interview, Guru said he came up with the whole jazzmatazz concept after noticing how a lot of artists were sampling jazz breaks to make hip hop records. And he just wanted to take it to another level you know, he actually created a new genre by he got into the studio with the real jazz artists and had them just record over some hip hop beats. That's how he came up with the whole jazzmatazz concept. 
Now, that same year, he was also in the movie called Who's the Man? With Ed Lover and Dr. Dre. That was my... I used to watch that movie all the time, too. I ain't seen that in a minute. But, you know, Guru decided to make... When Guru decided to make that Jasmine Taz album, DJ Premier, for the first time, started to work with other artists, which was Nas for his Illmatic album. And the list goes on. You know, DJ Premier started working with everybody. Now, after that, a year later, Gangstar released their fourth album titled Hard to Earn. Hip Hop Classic right there. That album hit number two on the U.S. top R&B hip hop albums, Billboard charts. The song Mass Appeal had the youngster sample in there. That song became their first charting single on the Billboard Hot 100 chart because it hit number 67 on the Billboard Hot 100 and number 42 on the Billboard R&B chart. But my junk on that album, though, man, Dwick, featuring Nice and Smooth, Greg Nice, Smooth B. Oh, that was my group, too, Nice and Smooth. But Dwick, Dwick, man, I used to pump that all the time. Dwick was actually out back in 1992 and was supposed to be on the Daily Operation album, but the label left it off for some reason. That's why they put it on the Hard to Earn album two years later. But, you know, that album has some fire on that. Code of the Streets, The Planet, Suckers Need Bodyguards. Oh, man, punk all that, man. All them songs. That album got, I think got four mics from the Source magazine, too. And that same year, J. Rue the Damager dropped his debut album, The Sun Rises in the East. And that was produced by DJ Premier. That's a classic album, too. J. Rue the Damager. Man. Now, after that, in 1995, Guru released another Jazz Matazz album. He did part two, volume two, The New Reality, which did pretty, they, they did pretty good overseas. That album did pretty good overseas. And that same year, Group Home dropped their debut album, Living Proof classic man that's a classic album too nutcracking little dap some wild <laughs> wild boys man now after that now guru ended up running into a lot of trouble with the law one incident he was arrested at the LaGuardia airport after they found a gun in his briefcase but he beat that case after pleading guilty to avoid prison time and they gave him three years probation now, another incident he had to face, he had faced an assault charge after a woman he was hanging out with one night accused him of being a hypocrite, saying he was an anti-white in his lyrics, but he dated white women. And she claims that Guru got so mad when she made that statement to him that he hit her in the head with a bottle. But, you know, that case, he was found out guilty in that case, though. Now, according to DJ Premier, too, he said during that time, Guru started drinking and abusing the alcohol like crazy. He said he always been a heavy drinker, but when he was going through those court cases, it got so bad to the point that DJ Premier said he couldn't even be around him. He left the group. Premier said he left the group halfway through the album they was working on. But, you know, they got back together, squashed the beef, and created one of the greatest albums that I ever heard 1998 the fifth album The Moment of Truth that album was on their new label New Tribe Records and was their most commercially successful album hit number one that album hit number one on the top R&B hip hop albums chart and was certified gold that was their first gold album DJ Premier production on that album, Guru lyrics on that album, was the best I I ever heard from them. Every track was a banger. You know my steez, royalty with Casey and JoJo, above the clouds, <laughs> spec the deck, JFK to the LAX, the militia. I mean every song, the song with Crump Snatcher, that whole album body of work classic that album's a classic that's one of the greatest hip-hop albums of all time in my books 
1998, <laughs> great year for music, man. I remember when I bought that Gangstar album, I remember I got the Goody Mob album, the second Goody Mob album, Big Pun album, DMX, Lauryn Hill along. When I got all, man, that album, man, that year, 1998 was crazy, man. But that same year, Guru also had a role in the movie The Substitute. Part two, though. He was in the part two of The Substitute School's Out. Now, after that, Gangstar released a compilation album called Full Clip, A Decade of Gangstar, which was a bunch of their old songs, some new songs, and a bunch of unreleased tracks was on there. After that, you know, Guru and uh, DJ Premier kind of took a break from each other. You know, DJ Premier always stayed busy. He was making beats for everybody. Everybody wanted Primo production. And, you know, they took a break. So around 1999, Guru, he got robbed. He got robbed and pistol whipped while leaving a recording studio in Queens, New York. They was trying to say uh, it was a setup. And, you know, after that incident in 2000, Guru, he dropped his third solo studio album titled Guru's Jazzmatazz, Street Soul. And then the following year, he dropped the album called Ballhead Slick and the Click on his own label called Ill Kid Records, which was distributed by Landspeed Records. And you know what? That album, the Ballhead Slick and the Click album, it hit number one on the Heat Seekers albums chart. Wow. Now, on June 24th, 2003 Gangstar got back together and they released the album titled The Owners and that album had some heat on there I remember the song Skills Skills was dope Right Where You Stand with Jada Kiss was dope Who Got Guns featuring Fat Joe and M.O.P but the album Guru and DJ Premier after that album they didn't talk to each other for about 6-7 years after that it was over. The relationship was over. Now, like I said earlier, DJ Premier and a lot of Guru's friends said it was all because of Guru's alcohol abuse. He was a very heavy drinker. And he wanted him, you know, Premier wanted him to get his life together. But other people that was around said Guru, the reason why DJ Premier and Guru broke up and Guru was more upset about the label, you know, the money. Money was missing. Money was being stolen from tours. And, you know, they was getting sued from a lot of samples that DJ Premier was using in the beats. You know, it was it was a struggle over the power and control of the groups. The group, they, their group. I mean, it was just a bunch of things that accumulated. And, you know, Gusmo, who was part of the uh, Gangstar Foundation, did an interview with Doggy Diamonds. He said, he said Guru left the group because of DJ's Premier drug habit. Wow, that's what he said. And you know, during that time, Guru ended up meeting a producer named Solar. And him and Guru ended up starting their own record label called Seven Grand Records. And him and his partner Solar continued to drop music and more Jasmine albums and on their label Seven Grand Records. And you know, Guru, you know, after leaving DJ Premier, you know, got his health right, stopped drinking. Stopped smoking weed. He was working out. He became a vegetarian. He joined the 5% Nation in which, you know, Guru thanked Solar for saving his life and helping him get through those hard times he was going through. He was very grateful for Solar helping him change his lifestyle. But, you know, people that was close to Guru started to notice a big change in him as he became more distant from friends and even his family when his business partner Solar came into the picture. Now, you know, some of the band members that was part of Guru's band at that time when he was going over tour overseas doing the whole Jazzmatazz thing, you know, some of the band members said uh, they witnessed him, they witnessed Solar abusing Guru. They saw Solar punch Guru in the mouth they say he was brainwashing Guru and treating him like a little kid in front of people. And, you know, that band he had, they ended up quitting because of Solar. Even DJ Doo-Wop left and him and Guru had been knowing each other for over 15 years. They couldn't take 
Solar's attitude and all that. And you know, you say Guru just roll whatever he say. They wrote, he rolled with him. Solar's baby mama, who was an assistant for the label at the time, said she seen him, she seen Solar beat Guru up a bunch of times. And one time it was so bad that he ended up having an asthma attack and Guru needed to go to the hospital. And she said Solar just left him there and didn't even check up on him. Wow. That's crazy. He would he would take his inhaler from him because he had, like I said, he had asthma real bad. You know, they say Solar would take his inhaler from him and everything. And, you know, she said, look, she said she told Guru, Solar's baby mama, who was the assistant there, she said she told Guru before she left the company, he needed to get away because if he don't, Solar's going to kill him. Wow. I mean, he said he would take his phone from him, take control of his emails account, everything. And plus rumors started circulating that they were lovers. But some people said that ain't true. And, you know, some of Guru's friends say that Guru really wanted to get back to working and doing music with DJ Premier because when he was doing shows overseas, all the fans, they want a gangstar. They just kept asking, where's DJ Premier? Which would make Solar mad. Guru was trying to figure out a way how to leave Solar. I just don't get it. Why would he let somebody treat him like that? But anyway, so on December 26, 2006, Gangstar's uh, record label, they released another compilation album titled Mass Appeal, The Best of Gangstar. But then, you know, around January 2009, when Guru had just finished his seventh solo album titled Guru 8.0, Lost and Found, Guru started to feel sick and he had a lot of back pain. So he went to see a doctor. Now, according to Solar, he said that they found a tumor on Guru's spine. And that's when he found out that he had some kind of rare blood cancer. So he did treatments and surgery. And, you know, he, he did the surgery to have it removed. But he went into respiratory failure and cardiac arrest. And he fell into a coma. But then it was reported in March that he was out of the coma and he had released a statement saying he was doing fine and he's recovering. And he said, Solar is the only person who has the accurate info on my situation. Any info from anybody else is false. I appreciate your well wishes and all the love. Hmm. That's what Guru said when he got out of coma, supposedly. He sent out that statement. But then months later, on April 19th, 2010, Guru died from multiple myeloma cancer. Hmm. Now, the crazy part, look, after his death, right, a lot of controversy, man, about how he died. And everybody was blaming his business partner, Solar. DJ Premier, Guru's friends and his family all said that they believe he has something to do with his death. There was something fishy going on. Now, the story goes because, see, when Guru was in the hospital, according to his family, they said they had no idea that Guru was in the hospital until about two weeks later after somebody else called them and told them that he was in the hospital. So when they went to go see him, got the tickets, plane tickets and everything, they got a call from Solar. And Solar told them that Guru didn't want them to see him in the condition that he was in. But then they got a call from Solar days later, again, right, saying that Guru was in a coma. And that's when the family rushed to go see him. Now, his brother, Guru's brother, got there first before the rest of the family and I guess he agreed to let Solar be the healthcare proxy and his power attorney and take on the responsibilities because of the you know the rest of the family they was all teachers and they had to get back to work and I guess it just made sense to Guru's brother to let Solar 
take on the responsibilities of being his, his caregiver. They was business partners. But see, according to Guru's sister, Patricia, she didn't agree with Solar being his caregiver proxy and said she never liked Solar and couldn't understand why he has such a hold and so much power over Guru. And she wanted a different person to handle the situation. But, you know, once Solar became the proxy, she said he stopped everybody from coming to see Guru. Even their parents couldn't call and get any information on what was going on. Wow. And that's when her son, Patricia's son, right, which is Guru's nephew, he went to the hospital to see, to see him, man. He saw him. He posted some videos about the whole situation and what was going on, trying to keep the fans updated on Guru's health. And, you know, he got the video on YouTube. I think his name is Justin Ruff. That's Guru's nephew. He said Solar was preventing Guru's family from visiting him and was exploiting a sick man. Wow. Solar wouldn't let nobody see him. But DJ Premier said he snuck in. He snuck in there to see him. He saw him and said it looked like Guru was already dead on the machine. He looked like he was already passed away on that machine. He said when he went in there, snuck in there, he said Guru's nails looked longer than a ruler. He had like a clump afro. His feet were swollen and his toenails were really disgusting and everything, man. Wow. But well, here's the crazy part. When Guru died, the family found out just like us and the fans on the internet. Mm, 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 mm. That's crazy. They found out just like us on the internet. I always thought when a person dies in the hospital, they're supposed to contact the closest family members. But they said, the family said they had to call the hospital to find out if it was true that he was dead. Wow, that's crazy. And, you know, once they found out, they asked the doctors, man, like, why didn't y'all contact the family? And the doctor said that Solar, his proxy, told them that he would contact the family and let them know. But he never did. Then they couldn't find his body. They couldn't find Guru's body. They had to call a bunch of funeral homes in New York until they found it. They found his body just in time at a funeral home because they was getting ready to cremate him. Wow. Now, here's another crazy thing that happened, right? So, after Guru died, Solar put out a letter to the world that was supposedly written weeks before Guru died. He was on his deathbed when he wrote this thing, right? Now, the letter basically says, uh, it's basically towards DJ Premier, saying that DJ Premier should not be allowed to trade under Gangstar's name in the future, and he do not wish his ex-DJ to have nothing to do with his name, likeness, events, tributes, etc., connected in any way to his situation, including any use of my name, or circumstance for any reason and he have instructed his lawyers to enforce this and he had nothing to do with him in life for over seven years and want nothing to do with him in death <laughs> he says solar has my life story and is well informed of my family situation as well as the real reason for separating from my ex dj wow this is the letter that's out it's a long letter. It's a real long letter. But for the most part, it seemed like Guru was praising Solar for everything he did for him in this letter. The letter is online. Y'all want to read the whole thing? Go online. Matter of fact, y'all read the whole thing. Tell me what y'all think in the comments. It's online. Guru's deathbed letter. But, you know, Guru's family, friends, and, you know, fans said, that letter is fake. That's a fake letter. It just didn't sound like him and questioned how could he write a letter in such a weakened medical condition. Plus, he was in a coma. He was comatose from February to April when he died to the day he died. He couldn't write that. All types of stuff was coming out about Solar, man. And somebody even hacked his email and found an info, found a bunch of info about him abusing and manipulating Guru. 
his email, <laughs> Solar email got hacked, man. They exposed all types of stuff. So as of today, his family was taking legal action on Guru's estate, his music, finance, to make sure Guru's son will get his share. Hey, Solar, he put out a book too titled The Moment of Truth, Guru, Gangstar, Life and Death Story, which is on Amazon. He's telling his side of the story where everything that went on. Basically, you know, Solar was like, he claimed that Guru's death was medical murder and people wanted him dead and the doctors had motives to kill him because they were connected to people with a lot of money. Hmm. He said, uh, it happens, to, it happens to rappers all the time. He said, <laughs> it happens to all the rappers and entertainers getting killed for their money all the time. Wow. I don't know, man. This is crazy. Guru went out like this, man. You know, on November 1st, 2019, DJ Premier released the last Gangstar album titled One of the Best Yet. So make sure y'all stream and buy that and support you can see his son, Guru's son named KC, rapping his verse in a video called Bad Name. He looked just like Guru, too. And look, Guru got a street name after him somewhere overseas in France somewhere, man. That's big. They loved, they was well-loved overseas. Man, crazy, man. 48 years old. Guru was 48 years old, man. Rest in peace. Rap legend. One of the greatest lyrical MCs. Guru of the group Gangstar. <laughs>